Very excited about doing this message today. It's called The Way, The Truth, and The Life. It's really a triple message. We'll do three of them, one after another, because there's so much to say on Resurrection Day. Turn with me, if you will, to John 14. Let's look at John 14. This is a tremendous scripture. It's only six verses, but it sure sets up what we're going to be saying today. Stand with me, if you will, in honor for God's word. We won't stand for every one of these scriptures, but I would like to stand at least for the opening one of John 14, and I'd like to read the first six verses. It says, let not your heart be troubled. This is, of course, our Lord Jesus speaking to you and me. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth. And the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You may be seated within God's powerful and wonderful word. Again, I like to do three vignettes, or if you will, many messages. The first one, obviously, the way. The way of the cross, not easy. The way of the cross for the believer, I pray that's you, for the believer is neither easy, simple, or automatic. It's filled with challenges. It's filled with hardships, trials, and difficulties. I'd like to start as we talk about the way and look at the ultimate trial of all history. It's found in Luke 23. In Luke 23, we see the ultimate trial, which is, of course, the trial of our Lord. I'll read it for us. Luke 23, starting with verse 1, and I'm going to read for a while. Let's listen up as we go. And the whole body of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ and a King, now part of that was absolutely true. (laughs) Part of it was a lie. He wasn't forbidding them to pay taxes. And Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, It is as you say. And Pilate said to the chief priests and the multitudes, I find no guilt in this man. But they kept on insisting, saying, he stirs up the people, teaching all over Judea, starting from Galilee, even as far as this place. And when Pilate heard it, he asked where the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself was also in Jerusalem at that time. Verse 8. Now, Herod was very glad when he saw Jesus, for he wanted to see him for 
a long time because he had been hearing about him and was hoping to see some sign performed by him, or an attesting miracle, if you will. And he questioned him at length, but he answered him, nothing. And the chief priests and the scribes were standing there accusing him vehemently. And Herod, with his soldiers, after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. Now Herod and Pilate became friends with one another on that very day. For before they had been at enmity with each other. And Pilate summoned the chief priests and the rulers of the people and said to them, You brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion. And behold, I have examined him before you, and I have found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you make against him. No, nor has Herod. For he sent him back to us, and behold, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish him and release him. Now he was obligated to release to them at the feast one prisoner. But they cried out all together, saying, Away with this man, release for us Barabbas. He was the one who had been thrown in prison for a certain insurrection made in the city and for murder. And Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again. But they kept calling out, saying, Crucify. Crucify him. And he said to them a third time, Why? What evil has this man done? I have found no guilt in him, demanding death. But I will punish him and release him. But they were insistent and with loud voices, asking that he be crucified. And their voices began to prevail. And Pilate pronounced sentence that their demand should be granted. And he released the man they were asking for who had been thrown in prison for insurrection and murder. But he turned Jesus over to their will. Powerful scripture. The trial of our Lord. I'd like to bring out of the passage you just finished hearing five directives that we heard for the believer, for you, for me. Five directives. The first is confession of faith. When Christ was before Pilate, this is not Herod, but when he was before Pilate, when Pilate asked him the question, are you king of the Jews? Jesus did answer and confessed and said, it is as you say. People many times will ask you, you seem different. What is that? Why are you doing that that way? That doesn't make any sense. Any valid question that in any way turns back to Christ or any way can bring glory to him or confession of him, we are imperiled and employed. And in every way, if you will, the gospel demands that we give an answer. Do you? Do I? Or is it embarrassing? Are we a little timid? I, you know, i just not really sure why I did that. Or do we confess, Jesus is my Lord, and I could not do that because of him. I believe in Christ as my Savior. Can you say that? I believe Christ is my Savior. You know, we need to get used to saying that and speaking confession of faith and truth in our life. Would you do it? Would you do it? Let it be done. Confession of our faith. 
The second one is there are times when we're silent. There are times where we say, mm. <laughs> we say nothing. When Christ was before Herod, Herod wanted to see a trick or some kind of magic show or a miracle, and he kept asking him all these things. Jesus said nothing. He was silent. There are times, and the Spirit will lead you to win, when we are meant to be silent. The world will mock you. The world will attempt to pull you into performance. Are you getting this, right? <laughs> to pull you into reaction. And there are times when you don't react. You don't come right back. You don't blast them out of the water. You're silent. It's powerful. Silence can be incredibly powerful as it's led by the Spirit. Sometimes it's, there's a moment when you just look in their eyes. I've done this many times. Just silently look in their eyes and watch what God will do. The third, again, these are directives out of the trial. No guilt. When you're guiltless before God because of the blood atonement of Christ, you're getting this, right? When you're guiltless because of Calvary, because of your acceptance of your sin sacrifice in Christ, it leaves you without guilt, and that establishes you powerfully. Do you have sin in Christ? No. Are you guilty as you confess in Christ? No. We as the people of God are guiltless and it establishes us. Let's look at Psalm 46. Beautiful Psalm. Psalm 46. Let's turn over there if we will. Turn to Psalm 46. Just want to read a few verses for us. Psalm 46, first few verses, says these magnificent words. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea. By the way, this is coming. You say, that's impossible verse. <laughs> it's coming. And though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, and though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, God is our refuge. Amen? God is our strength. Absolutely. Number four, again, these are directives right out of the trial. Number four, this might sound like a twist of words, but a way is the way. Say it with me. A way is the way. When they said, away with this man, and they wanted Barabbas, the murderer, there are many times in our walk with Christ where they will say, Away with this woman, away with this child, away with this man. And away is the way we need to go with him. The world rejects the believer, but as they reject the believer, there is the acceptance of the purposes of heaven. Fifth, the exchange is divinely orchestrated. It says there in verse 25, back in the first scripture we read, he released the man, this is Pilate, he released the man they were asking for. Now, I'm going to try to explain this a little bit, but this is a strange concept, and you're going to need revelation to even understand what I'm saying. God will exchange other people for your life. 
wow, how in the world can that be scriptural? Look at Isaiah 43. I'll read it for you. Isaiah 43, verses 4, says this. Since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored, and I love you, I will give men in your place and peoples in exchange for your life. Wow, that's incredible. For the believer, as you walk with God, I believe he will move people out of the way for your walk. Now, if you've never seen or even understand what I'm talking about, may God show you because this is a reality of the Christian's walk. It doesn't mean every time, doesn't mean every place, but you watch, he will do this. The way, the wonders of the scripture. 